Good afternoon and welcome to the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group public meeting. Um, our group is advocating for an evidence-based approach to pandemic management and today we are specifically addressing the topic of children and the return to schools and how this can be safely managed and what needs to be done. So. Um, Yesterday, Tony Holhan, the CMO in Ireland, tweeted that the in Ireland, the current 14 day incidence is 493 per 100,000. This is the highest it has been since the 31st of January. And we see that these numbers are increasing in 21 out of 26 counties. So we're seeing at the moment this situation where our cases are increasing and we need to think about how do we protect the unvaccinated and the vulnerable among us and we do know that due to eligibility uh, by age and access by age that the um youngest among us are the ones who are not yet vaccinated um larry brilliant who is a fantastic and well-regarded epidemiologist internationally ha commented on twitter that most of us have wanted to believe that children neither get nor spread COVID-19 in major ways, but it may be exactly the opposite. So it's not nice to think about the fact that children can be vulnerable and it's uncomfortable to address this, but we must deal with the evidence. We must um, look at the facts in front of us and then take appropriate action to take care of our young children and our vulnerable populations. So that's the framing for our conversation today. But as usual, we're going to start off with the situation update. And today we have that from James Merrick. Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Aoife. Um, and to give you a card, I guess, to Suligan, who will show a marvelous launch. So um, when Ben is bringing up the slides, um, you know, the high level, as Aoife mentioned, there's, there's a lot of, um, the high incidence rate of, of, of the of the virus on, on the island and um but i suppose since every week the vaccines that we every week of the webinar and uh, bi-weekly and um, the vaccines have also been um continuing good rollout so 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 it's 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 um a, a, a mixed picture so we'll just go into the slides and put some put some numbers on on, on those high level observations and um, so we'll start this week with the republic um so the last day I was on the webinar was the 14th of July, and we were just at that in the middle of the chart here. And this this is the daily average case numbers. So so the sort of numbers would be familiar to people on the, the daily figures coming out each evening. But when I was last on the webinar it was 14 July, in, in the middle of this um, sharp rise, and, and then post that there was a leveling, and then in the last week or two we were in this period of sharp rise again, and in the last few days. Um, there's been a little bit of plateauing. Uh, I suppose we'll see later in the week. Is that a broader effect, or will, will the rise continue? Um, but that's that's yeah, that's the sort of case numbers and and, and where we are, say, compared to early summer, and um, with the onset of, of Delta. So so thank you, Ben. We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, the next slide just breaks breaks out those numbers by age group, um, and there's actually due to a little issue, there's a lag in the data here, so it, it's a week it's a week behind the last chart, but it it, it just gives an idea that that the um, high prevalence in the younger age groups, the top line there is 19 to 24, the second line is the blue line is 13 to 18 year olds, um, and so as we've pointed out for numerous back a number of weeks now about the, the higher prevalence in younger people but and this was observed in Northern Ireland a couple of weeks ago too um, with enough virus spreading in the community um, the older age groups at the bottom of the chart we, we start to see an uptick in, in cases there too um, due to you know a combination of some people in those communities not being vaccinated versus some breakthrough infections and um, yeah so so that's just that in the indicative at, at the bottom right of the chart there. Um, so the next slide, please, Ben. And so just on just staying with the Republic on, on the vaccination rollout. So um, this is a government slide from earlier in the week. And um, so, so five weeks ago, we were at 56% of 18 plus, 56% uh, of adults fully vaccinated. And now we're up to 81%. So this is the uptake levels in Ireland are, are incredible. Um, 
And what actually surprised me in this chart was I hadn't realized personally just how high the teenagers, the level of vaccination teenage um, 12 plus age group has, has really rolled out over the past few weeks. So we're up to 73%. Now, in the fully vaccinated figures, I, I believe that's when the second dose goes into the arm, which is uh, different from when the actual full immunity from the vaccine kicks in, which is, it tends to be a week or two later, depending on the vaccine. So, But um, that just gives a sense. So, so the relationship between um, cases and uh, hospitalizations and deaths have changed, and also between activities in society and cases have changed. But, um, um, you know, if, if, when vaccine, if, if you know, a vaccine is rightly or wrongly, vaccine is a big part of the strategy and, you know, they've been wonderfully effective and this kind of gives us an update of the progress over the summer. Um, great progress. Uh, ne next slide, please, Ben, and we'll just go to Northern Ireland now. And um, this is a trend. I, so again, we see higher prevalence of the virus in younger age groups. And, and again, this trend we noted a number of weeks ago about levels starting to increase in the older age groups say, say the, the bottom two lines in the chart there are 60 plus 60 plus and 80 plus age groups and um so it's just a it's just a continuation of, of that point uh, we'll go to the next slide please ben and we'll, we'll show and again there's a little lag here due to a data issue so um the cases have actually increased in northern ireland since the end of those last lines um, just to show northern ireland in the context of um britain and um you know, when I was again, when I was last on the presentation here, the, the uh, we were in this very sharp increase in England. Um, that that came down and um, that came down, and now it's leveled off, and maybe it's a slight increase again, and similar in Wales and Scotland. And obviously, you know, this matters in the context of the amount of connections between between the two islands. Um, so to give a sense of Northern Ireland, this is a population weighted average of case numbers. So we just give a sense of Northern Ireland in, in the in the in the uh, in the United Kingdom context. If we go to the next slide, please, Ben. Um, so this is just kind of, you know, major connections with the with the island here, the UK, US, European Union, population weighted average cases. Um, so we, we um, so, you know, the United States, I think will be talked about today, there are stories about pediatric hospitals being full in Texas at the moment and, and, and some places where vaccine levels have been lower. And it's been a very sharp, there's been a, the Delta wave, I suppose, has hit the United States since very low levels of virus in the community earlier in the summer. Um, and the kind of broader European picture has been, been able to con contain Delta um, a little better than other countries, uh, other parts of the world. And then the second, next final slide then is our kind of second globe, just global context. I kind of like to show this every every few every so often. And um, this is just a record the case number since the start of the pandemic. And you know, very different. It's apples and oranges in the sense of how cases are counted or detected in different regions. But it gives a sense. Um, so we, this kind of big peak area in spring was driven by the terrible situation in India. And then this recent increase um, driven by Delta in the United States and, and elsewhere in the world, Indonesia has been on the news as well. Um, maybe is it beginning to peak there? The last couple of days, this rolling average, it's, it's too early to say. But um, I suppose the big point is there's uh, locally, nationally, internationally, there, there's, there's still a lot of the virus around. Um, and um, Vaccines, you know, vaccine rollout is at different stages in different places, and, and obviously different groups are not yet eligible. So um, that's just to give the context for the discussion today. So, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, James. Yes, um, very interesting, and I think it is very much in the context of today's conversation worth. Uh, pointing out again, highlighting what you already showed there, that the vaccine uptake among young people has been really great. Um, young people are, um, you know, they have been doing their part throughout this whole thing. They've been staying at home. They've had their education disrupted. And now when the vaccines have become available, they are, you know, getting into queues and waiting and, uh, you know, spending that time to get their vaccine. So I think it's really great. So we have an interesting conversation uh, for you today in terms of looking about how we can um, get 
make schools safer for the return of the in-person teaching uh, where we're going to have these groups of children in the same room together. And um, before we get into that um, more deeply, I'd like to very quickly ask Yanir Baryam just to tell us, because there's been some news from Israel just very recently in terms of what they're planning to do there with their return to school. And I think it's just an interesting piece of context to set up the rest of our conversation. Could you quickly introduce that to us, please, Yanir? Sure. Uh, we underst I understand that um, a, a main point uh, in Israel has been made that the major transmission of the outbreak there is among children and youth. The, many of the youth are now vaccinated in Israel already, uh, and they're rapidly vaccinating them. I would like to share uh, for a moment, if, I, if you can give me a screen share, uh, and show the... Um, uh, a trajectory of the outbreak in Israel uh, so that we can see uh, what it looks like. Can uh, I be given that um, uh, screen share if you can? But uh, the, the main thing is that they are now talking about the possibility of postponing schools start uh, at least by a month uh, because of the fact that children are the drivers of the pandemic, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, infections uh, in Israel. The infections there have gone from uh, under 10 uh, per day uh, to now being at, uh, uh, in the last few days, 8,000 or 9,000 uh, per day. So a factor of a thousand fold increase uh, in what has been just uh, uh, really uh, a couple of months. Uh, so that's a huge increase that's happened, uh, and it's driven, uh, according to their discussion, by children uh, becoming infected and transmitting it. Uh, and so they're thinking about postponing schools by at least a month uh, from the beginning of September uh, to, the, to October. Thank you, Yanir. Yeah, it is interesting because, you know, we've been looking at Israel a lot, I suppose, as a country that's very highly vaccinated and very organized. And it is interesting to see that even there, they're talking about delaying the, the restart of, of schooling there. So um, we're very lucky today that we have uh, Professor Orla Hegarty from UCD um, Architecture um, joining us. And she has extraordinary expertise um, and has been a really wonderful contributor to the public debate in Ireland and internationally in terms of how we can actually take concrete practical steps to make spaces safer. And um, of course, schools are indoor spaces that are going to now, we hope, because we do want a safe return to school, have uh, numbers of children in rooms together in order to receive their schooling. We do not want to have more educational disruption. So I think the important thing we then have to talk about is how do we make these spaces safer? And I think from a building structural point of view and an air ventilation point of view, Orla has really interesting contribution to make there in terms of practical, sensible advice. So thank you so much for coming today, Orla. And um, I was just wondering, you know, in your view and with your expertise, what would you be advising schools to do now um, to to help ensure a safe and sustained return to schools, to schooling? Thanks, Aoife. Um, well, I think firstly, the, the broader picture, you know, is not is not good at the moment. You know, the case levels are higher in the community than when schools were suspended at the start of January. Um, the virus we have, the variant we have now is twice as transmissible as the one last summer. And we're going back into school with a very different context um, of risk than they did last September. Um, so th th that's, that's the bigger picture. Also, I suppose when children went back in, April and uh, March of this year, they they had been at home for several months. They weren't bringing virus mostly into school with them. Uh, whereas now we have children coming back from holidays and international flights and everything else. So um, the, who is in the classroom is a higher risk as well. Um, that said, um, the risk really in every school comes down to who's in the room, what the air in the room is and whether the virus can physically move from one child to another. The only risk to any child or any class is 
is whether the virus can physically move at a molecular level. Um, so we're talking firstly about masks. Um, uh, I think we need to have a, a, a proper conversation with people about why masks are so important. Everybody in Ireland has been great wearing masks. The uptake is great, but how they're wearing them isn't great. I think a lot of people think it's protection from a sneeze or a cough rather than it's a protection for every breath you take. And I think if we explained the mechanism of how a mask works, people might wear them better and people would understand why they're so important now in schools. Um, secondly, it, it's obviously the mask is for close range and then you're talking about the room. Last year, the schools managed really by overventilating, by being cold. Um, uh, and I think they did suppress a lot of uh, spread in schools by taking that initiative and great credit to the teachers and, and yeah. schools for doing that. Um, but that's not going to be enough this year. It's just not going to be enough in the situation we're in. So schools are being given, given CO2 monitors, which is great. Uh, they can start to learn about this and they can catch areas of high risk. Uh, but once we catch the areas of high risk, we then need to act. Um, and, and that's probably going to be filtration or reduced occupancy or using rooms differently or timetabling differently. A whole load of strategies uh, that, that need to be done and individually. Can I just ask what you mean by saying the, the, the overventilation won't be enough? What do you mean by that? Because uh, what I understood you were saying before was that because the teachers, I mean, they were really great in that they were quickly recognizing the role of ventilation, but of course they had no way of knowing how much to ventilate so they opened everything and it could have been it could have been sufficient to have less and they could have been a bit cozier and also ventilated but now if you're saying it's not enough um are you saying that even really high ventilation is not going to be enough or what what do you mean by that well um, I suppose partly I'm saying the risk is greater. There's more virus in the community and and it's more transmissible. So that's a different context to what we had last year. Um, what a CO2 monitor will give you is you have a dial really now, whereas before it was, you know, it had to be at 10 or zero. Um, now they'll be able to say, well, look, we've realized it's very windy today. We only actually need the windows open very slightly and it's fine. We're keeping the levels good or it's a really calm day. And no matter what we do, we're not getting air flow um, or this classroom is very sheltered side of the building. We are going to have to bring in something supplementary and um, we're going to have to bring in filtration or we're going to have to move this class into a sports hall um, or we're going to have to not use this room or lock off those locker rooms or have lunch outside or whatever it is. So yes, people can respond much better now and they can manage the risk much better with CO2 monitoring. Um, but they probably will find that there are some places um, that really need more. And, and I would think specifically about things like early childcare, where there's a lot of smaller rooms, uh, special needs education. And, and particularly, I would say there are some urban schools where they are in more crowded classrooms um, and when there's a higher risk profile outside schools. So maybe children in multi-generational and overcrowded homes, children who are taking public transport to school. Um, you know, you can see that there's a huge difference in risk for those children you know, in a prefab in a suburban Dublin crowded school, then there might be for a child in a rural school where there are 15 in the class. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we need to be much more targeted about the interventions. And so have you seen the guidance that has come from the Department of Education and Skills yet, the DES? Have you seen, there has been some discussion about the CO2 monitors, of course, as we know, and I, think, I believe largely thanks to your advocacy among others, there are going to be CO2 monitors in the schools but um, it, there's been a bit of discussion about what would be deemed the acceptable level parts per million of CO2 in a room um, before an intervention was needed. Um, have you seen or are you aware if the, the guidelines have come down from the department and um, I, if they are seen, clear? I haven't seen what's finalised, but it's clear. I mean, the expert group recommended uh, between 800 and a thousand parts per million CO2 should be the maximum. Um, generally, it's accepted that around 800 parts per million means that every breath you take, about one percent might be air that somebody else has exhaled. Um, so that's you know that's a that's obviously not 
eliminating risk, but it is very much reducing it. Um, outside air is about 400 parts per million. So we do know what it should be. Um, and I think um, we we will probably find that people can learn very quickly. There'll be a learning curve in this. Um, but we do need to be ready, I think, for situations where people just can't manage this into a safe zone. I mean, I would say we have a huge advantage in Ireland that we're in a very temperate climate. We will have a month now over September where it's still comfortable to have windows open as much as we need to. So we do have an adjustment and a learning curve here where people can start to, you know, we're not going to be into minus five degrees anytime soon. Um, yeah. And we don't have air conditioned schools. So, you know, even compared to America, I think we have a lot of advantages here. Um, in terms of trying to manage this, it's 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 you know it is doable. And um, the other thing I'm advocating at the moment is that we bring forward some of the retrofit budget that's there for schools under climate change commitments, and um, because our climate change commitments uh, by default with energy improvements and buildings actually. In include indoor air improvements and um, so so it's it's already factored into government policy and committed for and um, there's no reason why we shouldn't bring forward the ventilation and indoor air improvement component of that even independently um, and and do that now as a public health initiative um, uh, so the two things are very very connected and i think we just need to join the dots a bit in terms of public policy and can those things be done quickly? Like if you're talking about that kind of retrofitting, what's the kind of time scale? Or maybe there's, I suppose, certain things that can be quick. Um, well, well, filtration can be done quickly because they can be bought off the shelf. Obviously, there might be supply chain issues if you're trying to do a lot of places at once. Uh, but there are plenty of, uh, it's very low technology fan and filter. And there's lots of DIY videos available on how people can put together their own filtration in a very basic way. So so I think, you know, we, we could all, make an effort and pull together on that um, in terms of uh, classroom ventilation for climate change um, again there's you know it's relatively low simple technology um, in in simple terms knocking a small hole in a wall and preheating the air that comes in so rather than bringing in cold air through a window you're bringing in air through a small unit in the wall that warms the air so you're getting the ventilation levels you would get from windows but it's not drafty Okay, that's great. So just um, I'm going to bring in Anthony shortly as well, because I know he uh, maybe knows a bit more about the school guidelines, which I think are very relevant to talk about today. But also just with you, Orla, um, the uh, HBSC, the Health Protection Surveillance Centre, if you look at their website and under the frequently asked questions, it has how does COVID-19 spread? And it says the virus that causes COVID-19 can spread from person to person through respiratory droplets. And they don't seem to mention aerosol at all. I don't know if you were previously aware of this, but how much of a, a problem is it that there is still a delay in the acknowledgement of the scientific evidence for aerosol spread? I think there's enormous mixed messaging. Um, I think it's really unclear to people. Um, I, I continuously hear people saying, do the usual things we've been telling you for a year, um, you know, keep your distance, wash your hands. Oh, and by the way, open a window. Um, we know that the risk of a surface contact now from the CDC is one in 10,000. Um, so the distraction of, of hand washing and surface hygiene is 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 actually distracting people from doing the things that are really, really important. Um, I, I would love to see clearer messaging. Um, I, I would love to see particularly people giving medical advice in the media um, of, of not using confusing language, um, not saying that distancing is adequate. It's not indoor, distancing is not adequate um, indoors. 85% of the, the virus st is light enough and small enough to stay airborne. It's not falling to the floor within two metres. Um, so I think we need clarity. And I'd like to see some public health messaging around correct mask wearing and why it's mm -hmm. important. And, and the risk in vehicles. We, we haven't heard any messaging around vehicles. And, and I think that's a major area where, you know, somebody had described it that if you were to design something to spread the virus, it would be a, it would be a car. Yeah. You know, you put people in a small space and you'd recirculate the air. Um, and we might expect so, there will be some car sharing um, for the return to school. It's a very natural thing. And um, so one of the one of the very simple pieces of advice is to have like a diagonally opposite <laughs> front seat and back window open so that you get a, a, 
you know, even even a couple, even of, even five yeah. centimeters will make a difference. Just to get because just to create a, a cross draft and drag the air out so that it mm. it doesn't have the chance to linger in the air inside the car. And then similar, like as you say, well fitted masks of a high quality. And I think the advice there, this simple practical advice there as well, because we know that there are. There's the plain old cloth masks, which were good enough when we didn't have anything else. But now we know better and now we have availability of better quality masks that are actually filtering. And if they're not, if they're not making good contact with the face, one of those cloth masks can be an additional thing just to press it onto your face a little bit better and to make mm -hmm. a, a better contact. So it's yeah, like you say, Orla, quite simple when, uh, mm -hmm. when the advice is given plainly. Um, I wonder, Anthony, could I bring you in now? Because we were talking there a bit about schools and a bit about what the guidelines are from the Department of Education. So we're going to have the CO2 monitors in the schools. Um, we hope that the, the threshold, the acceptable threshold will be set to 800 parts per million, because I think that's the most sensible and evidence based mm -hmm. one, as Orla mentioned, 800 slightly above could be OK. But um, what has been mentioned previously is uh, 1,400 parts per million, which not only is it not good for um, reducing uh, COVID transmission, it's also <coughs> not good for the child's concentration <coughs> because with this high uh, high CO2 in the in the room, they can start start feeling sleepy potentially and find it harder to concentrate. Mm -hmm. But even forgetting that for the moment, what does the department tell the teachers to do if the if the level goes up, or tell the school to do and have they provided good guide, guidelines yet to uh, schools? I, I don't think their guidelines are very good. Um, I read very carefully their guidelines on CO2 monitoring. So the bottom line is every classroom will not have a CO2 monitor. For reasons I don't begin to understand, the plan is to provide one CO2 monitor for about every one and a half classrooms, which is interestingly arbitrary. The cutoff limit they've suggested is 1500 to 1400. This is the cutoff limit in the building regulations, apparently, for really bad ventilation. And what, what they say, and I'm quoting, is that if your CO2 limit is above 1400 to 1500, you should consider additional ventilation, unquote. Okay. And their suggestion as to how you go about obtaining additional ventilation is that you consult with an engineer and have a, a purpose design solution for your school done. And leaving aside the fact that there's four and a half thousand schools in the country, some of which are on more than one site, more than one building. I don't think there's that many uh, ventilation engineers in the country. The, this contrasts with the approach taken in many other countries where they said, right, here's your CO2 monitors and here's your filters. So the Germans yeah. have placed HEPA filtration units in most classrooms in Germany. Now, whether they're necessary or not, I don't know. That would be Orla's territory, not mine. But it means the school management is not being asked to make a series of relatively challenging technical decisions about which they know as much as I do uh, about what, what is the right ventilation for their school. Uh, we've seen oh, last winter um, the, the 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 misery of some children trying to learn in what were very very cold environments. So you had classrooms where the teacher was wearing a jacket, every child was wearing their jacket, everyone was muffled up. But actually, you can't write wearing gloves. You can't take notes wearing gloves. So it was not a nice experience for many children. When I compare the professionalism of the guidance notes with the professionalism of guidance notes provided, say, in the UK, um, there's no comparison. The, the, it is very evident that the guidance notes for Ireland were written by people who were very unfamiliar with the area, who simply took sections they didn't fully understand from a variety of different places and stuck them together. The guidance from the British Health and Safety Executive, for example, uh, which we've referenced in our paper, is much clearer, much more forthright and much easier to follow. And that's on the department. The department's responsibility is to make this happen. Now, the department will tell you that it's the school's responsibility. And the department are in the comfortable position of dictating every aspect of the school's lives without having any responsibility at all for the consequences. Mm. 
But I don't think that's Is tenable it? in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, we have a comment from one of our attendees as well, who um, I, 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 I guess is involved in a school because they seem to be very knowledgeable and they say there's no CO2 monitors coming for the special education rooms or for offices or staff rooms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, these are all places where transmission can occur. So that's not uh, not necessarily that that's not showing jo joined up thinking and not like not broadly understanding the problem. Um, so there's a question here that three questions um, or kind of gr grouped questions from one of our attendees saying, um, do we believe that the government are going to implement safety mitigations needed? If not, why not? And um, under the current circumstances, do you believe it's open to uh, safe? Sorry, to open schools. So maybe I'll ask. That's that's an opinion, but I might ask um, Anthony and Orla and even Gabriel as well to to give their view on that question. Is the government going to do what's necessary to put in new safety mitigations, and is it safe to to open schools at the moment? In your opinion, I'll start with you, Orla. Um, is it safe? I, 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 in some ways, yeah, every school is going to have to do a risk assessment. I think we need a masking policy. I think we need better guidance for the schools and I think we need better supports. Um, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's not enough to do things piecemeal. It's not enough to ask people to try and figure it out on the ground. And, and, and the reason for that isn't just about our children. I know some people are not that don't seem that concerned about children's health, but we're talking about a million children going back to school in the next mm -hmm two weeks. If you look at a population level and think of them as a million people in a population of less than five million and exposing a million of our citizens in the next into higher risk conditions in the next two weeks and think of it in those terms. Schools is about all of us. It's not just about the schools. Um, very few of the children going back, even the 16, 17 year olds will be double vaccinated. Um, so we're talking about a huge unvaccinated population going into what we know are high risk settings, environmental, environmentally high risk. Um, so this is this is about this isn't about schools. This is about government's pandemic strategy mm. and for mm. the next month will go. And and that's that's about hospitals. That's about everywhere else as well. Um, so so I would like to see an assessment of the school risk. In, at that at that high level as well as at in low level, um, uh, is it safe to go back? I I have I have serious concerns about it. I of course I want everybody back safely and immediately, but I have serious concerns about what the next month is going to bring. Thanks, Orla. Um, Anthony, what would your view on that be? I mean, I would agree with Orla. I think the the risks are oh, that, first of all, if we have a large number of cases in children, which is likely, these children are not well. They need someone, they will mostly need someone to mind them at home. The implications of that are that one or other parent takes time off from work and becomes a close contact of someone who is infected. Leaving aside, and for the moment, the risk to the parents themselves of being infected or reinfected if they are vaccinated. The, those people will then have to isolate for a period of time. And it's been a major challenge in parts of the United States, where a substantial number of healthcare workers are home minding sick children, do, you know, doing something important, but they're not able to go into work. Uh, and the, the second part is we know children seldom get seriously ill from this, but they do get seriously ill. We've had at least one case of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in Ireland. That child was described to me as being really, really unwell. The likelihood is we will see more. We have 31 intensive care beds for children in Ireland. The other, I looked at the figures the other day, there were seven free. It wouldn't take very much for COVID-19 to fill those beds and overfill those beds. A small proportion of children will require hospital care. A very small proportion will require intensive care. 
but we don't have that much capacity in intensive care because children don't normally need it. And we have the question about long COVID. We, we know that long COVID occurs in children. There is some discussion as to whether it occurs at about the same rate as in adults or at a somewhat lower rate. But it is clear that it's not uncommon. And it's the impact of developing long COVID in a child, even if it, it recovers within a year, which is what one would hope. That's a year out of a child's life, a year, a year when they won't be able to perform as effectively at school, when they may not be able to do all the things they want to do with sports and hobbies and playing with friends or whatever it may be. So the cost of this can run across a, a child's whole life. And we have this view that just because there are not large numbers of children dying, that this is immaterial. And I, I've had that said to me in not quite those words by people, but Actually, this is a very nasty illness in children, and it's an illness well worth preventing. And as Orla has put it very eloquently, you know, we have a million people coming back to the, the schools. We have another batch of people coming back to the universities and the other third level uh, colleges over the course of September. Not, quite a few of those people are not vaccinated, will not be protected and will get ill. And it's up to us to minimize the risks as far as we can to those people. Thanks, Anthony. Gabriel Scally, I'd like to bring you in now, if I could. And one thing is that um, I think we've had the opportunity as well to learn from other countries. So you're based in the UK, and I think there's some return to school happening already and um, shorter summer holidays than we have. But also we're seeing a lot of reports from the US about pediatric cases there. And um, there is a there is certain suggestion that the Delta variant is different with regard to infection and um, symptoms in younger people. Could you maybe tell us there what we know and what is still uncertain or what is suggested maybe from some patchy preliminary data, but um, how does Delta change things? Well, it does certainly seem to be changing things and there are reports quite widespread reports. I haven't seen properly organized data yet, but the reports that it is indeed affecting more children and more children are ending up admitted to hospital and are some are ending up in intensive care. And, uh, you know, that's, but it's uh, what I, I think the important thing is we should be preventing this. It's not enough for us to act as voyeurs here that we have to see it happening before our eyes, before we do anything. And that's unfortunately what's happening. For example, the UK decided not to vaccinate anyone under the age of 18. Uh, two weeks later, they changed their minds and decided to vaccinate, give one dose to 16 and 17 year olds. And there is a report that that was because one clinician saw a couple of cases coming into um, their hospital, and, and they then argued on the relevant committee that it all changed. I mean, that's a ridiculous way to go about things. We should be doing prevention. Prevention is what it should be, and we should be preventing children being exposed to the risk. And there is a risk, and we need to do that, and we need to do it now. If we're, go if we're going to bring schools back safely, uh, we should do it now. Do I believe uh, the government will do it? I, well, I've been interested and involved in Irish politics for too long to believe anything about any uh, government that they will do something when they haven't said they will and, and, and signed on the dotted line. And there is no sign on the dotted line about doing really basic preventive measures. Mm -hmm. The sort of things and, and, and uh, you know, things are happening around the world really fast and we should be looking at the best practice. For example, if you look at California and they've passed law in their state legislature about what should be happening in schools and they have a program uh, for improving the heating ventilation air conditioning systems in all their schools uh, for example on um, co2 monitoring they specify the nature of the monitor that it should be running all the time uh, that it should be uh, very detailed about the specification of it and where in terms of where it should be cited uh, that it should be um, wall mounted that it should be so many feet away from windows and doors, that it should uh, keep a record of its monitoring, and what should and there should be a, a, an alarm system or a notification system when it goes above a certain level, 
and that if it goes above that level, more in the level of 1,100 parts per million, if it goes above that more than once a week, they have to get a qualified person in to improve the ventilation system in that classroom. Now, that's the sort of detail and expertise and commitment we need. And the, 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 the weird thing about it, this isn't huge amounts of money. These are really basic things uh, that we need to be getting a grip of. And Orla is quite right, you know, we, we, we don't really, we, I think we've lost a lot of our wisdom over the decades about ventilation and how to ventilate um, places without making them freezing cold. You know, it was one of the things last year, every time I said, well, we should be opening the windows and ventilating people would say, oh, we'll all freeze to death. And uh, of course, you won't all freeze to death. And, and uh, uh, but, but there are ways of ventil ventilating, properly ventilating, which just, just means moving the air and changing the air all the time, preferably, with, without people being uh, uh, frozen. We just need to get on and do it. And I, I don't understand why we're, why we're not doing that. And I think parents and, and young people, particularly young people in secondary school, have a, you know, they, they have a responsibility to work with the schools uh, and, and try and keep themselves uh, safe and their schools safe and their companions safe and their children safe and, and I think um, and, and we, we have heard we've heard on the on uh, one of these webinars from about great teachers who have done really done the job for their school have filters uh, HEPA filters in, in every classroom in every classroom of the school and they report not having any cases in the yeah. school and, and that's just fantastic and that should be it that should be what should be happening everywhere prevention should be the one to do we see also so we have a comment in from one of our attendees that the the cdc and the american association of pediatrics have issued guidance and strongly endorsed face masks in children uh, five plus in schools to protect them and each other of course uh from the delta variant should the irish association of pediatrics HICWA and hpsc be doing the same we have another related comment from somebody else who's saying as a parent of uh primary school children who can they be lobbying to get masks in like for the, the younger children? And of course, um, as you just mentioned there, Gabriel, not every young person has the vaccine as an option. In Ireland, it's an option for 12 plus. In the UK, it's not an it's I think it's 16 plus that there's a vaccination available. So these other prevention me mechanisms, methods are are necessary. But um we do we need um I think I know the answer to this, but do we need a clearer statement about mandating um, masks for all school children, primary school children included? I, I, I personally think we do. And what's more, we need to do something about the availability and the specification of those masks. Uh, mm -hmm. As was said earlier, uh, the old notion, and it is an old notion and it's a wrong notion, that uh, droplet spread is the main means of uh, COVID-19, um, the disease being developed. It's not. The infection doesn't come from droplet spread, it comes from airborne. And we have to alter, and, and the old face coverings uh, with uh, layers of cloth or uh, the, the notion that you can put a scarf around your face and that, that deals with it all is all nonsense. And we should be saying it's nonsense and we should be moving into proper, what they call FFP2 or FFP3 masks. Now, and there are issues about that. And the reason why the, the authorities, the Department of Health and other departments need to take it seriously is because, it, 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 as was said earlier, these need to be properly fitting masks. Mm -hmm. And with children, there is an issue about helping the children find the right mask to suit their age and their, and their physical development and help it fit and help it fit comfortably so that they feel comfortable wearing it for a prolonged uh, period. And, and that requires, you know, really organized effort in terms of, and I think those supplies of masks should be provided to the school so that every Every child will be provided in school with those face coverings uh, and there'll be face coverings and properly fitted. And one of the reasons why this is all so possible in places like the States is because they've also invested very heavily in school nurses. And school nursing is such a great public health resource. And, uh, you know, New York, one of the first things they did when the pandemic, pandemic struck was they decided that they would have a full time um, uh, school nurse in every school in New York. And that's the sort of initiatives we should be seeing. 
Thanks, Gabriel. Um, Jerry, um, I thought maybe I could bring you in now, uh, Professor Jerry Colleen, just to talk um, specifically about primary schools, uh, because we have, as has been mentioned earlier, the government strategy has been heavily reliant on vaccines. And even though the vaccines are wonderful, they're working really well, they are definitely making a huge impact um, on the situation in every country where they've been rolled out. They're not available for our primary school age children. And um, what is the significance of that? And, uh, and any other um, comments maybe on the, the primary school situation? Thank you very much, Aoife. Yeah, I've, I've um, I think the thing that bothers me and, and causes me to lose sleep about the situation we're in at present is that we have a failure of value systems facilitated by a societal buy into wishful thinking. We, I've just finished a holiday where I've seen us give indoor dining and pints priority over the reopening of our schools with our children in them. And we all need to wrap up those decisions in some comfort blanket. And that comfort blanket has been ignoring lots of science that was either well-defined at the very outbreak of the pandemic um, and I, I can discuss some of those. So for example, I'm just thinking about the things that I knew already in April last year. Um, I was already reading papers about severe pediatric COVID from China. Uh, you know, long COVID in kids is not a new thing. Uh, I can remember the first reports of Kawasaki-like syndrome in kids coming from Italy, um, northern Italy, at the out, out, outside of the outbreak in Europe. You know, masks work. The Chinese told us that, um, you know, they also told us in January 2020 that the, um, you know, that the gap in the data where we didn't see pediatric cases initially in the initial outbreak in Wuhan was a problem, not a solution. They told us that, um, you know, the role of schools in overall transmission has been clear as crystal since, you know, mid 2020. I mean, I, if we don't accept that, we just have to close down all the world's best journals. Uh, you know, it's, this is not a new thing. There's no, there's no room for debate. Uh, there's no room for debate about masks. And then, like some old science that is, has been established for decades and that we need to think about in our current situation is that what we call heterogeneity of transmission uh, stabilizes transmission. And what that simply means is that the standard simple models uh, only make sense if you assume that everybody's evenly mixed, uh, like, like sugar dissolved in water. But that's not how you know, human populations work. We're all, we all cluster into groups, and so you get a very different picture you know, of how a human population interacts, even if you just walk a few hundred yards. And, um, and so those kind of variations can, can actually increase the reproduction number by about tenfold. Now, particularly um, because basically the stability of disease transmission is defined not by its average, but by its highest level in a society. It, you know, it's the, the hotspots that define what your target is for getting out of this. Now, if you take all the unvaccinated people that remain in society and you put them in the same place, you've got a what's called a hotspot. We've been calling them hotspots for years. And so even if you just look at our primary schools, you know, our primary schools are most probably perfectly adequate in, as we stand right now, to drive sustained endemic transmission indefinitely. Uh, and what that means is that each and every child in a primary school, unvaccinated, will get COVID, or, you know, very close to all of them. And of course, all the vaccinated people associated with those primary schools those people are all going to be exposed and have their their vaccination tested. You know, the, the bulletproof vest will have to see how many bullets it can cope with. Mm -hmm. And for some of us who have, you know, underlying conditions, you know, it's just that puts you in the when, not if scenario. So, yeah. so that's old science. You know, it's been described really well. The classic papers from the, the 1990s describe it like for HIV. HIV would disappear from most countries if it was based on the average exposure level, but it's actually sustained by 
uh, you know, overwhelmingly by a small fraction of the population who, um, who, who have ex exceptionally high, you know, exposure rates. And um, I hope they're having a lot of fun in the process because uh, the cost is massive. And so, so this is old science. It applies to our schools. It applies to our children. And, and it applies to the rest of us um, who are their families. So, uh, you know, this is all crystal clear. It's not open for discussion. And, and we just need to face up to the facts um, and, and just get out, get our heads out of the sand on wishful thinking, because that's what's put us, and then stop making excuses for ourselves and, and take off the comfort blanket. You know, we've done this to our kids. We've done it. Yeah, and it's just not acceptable to just say that every child is going to be exposed and then that, because we know a percentage of those will have adverse outcomes, even if it's a small percentage, there's going to be a large number if we let it go through all school aid, school age children. Ivan Perry, I'd just like to bring you in if I could, because there's a few questions coming in about the role of antigen testing in a school setting. And I just wonder what would your uh, view be on that and the usefulness of that? Yes, yeah, sure, uh, sure, 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 I'd be happy to comment on that. And just before we, that, I want to come back to the question of, 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 about HICWA and the Irish Society of P P P P Pediatrics. As we remember, HICWA is the, is the, the Health Information and Quality Authority, and they have a statutory role in inspecting, inspecting hospitals and nursing homes, etc. So I think we urgently need HICWA standards for the safe reopening of, of, of schools that, that, that address all of the, the issues we, we, we've just dis discussed this morning, the ventilation and the, the mask wearing and so on. And I think these, these standards need to be published and, 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 and enforced. And I would certainly agree with the statement that the children over the age of five should be wearing masks uh, that, 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 that are providing decent filtration and not the... Um, cloth coverings. To, 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 to come back to the issue of antigen testing, obviously this has been fairly controversial in, in, um, in uh, Ireland over the past year, but I think, I think schools are one setting where the, the, there is almost certainly a, a, a place for uh, uh, antigen testing using, it, using a, a well-validated method, because it, if we have re repeated antigen testing, it does give us a real opportunity to, to actually to, to take um, children with, 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 with a s s s symptomatic infection out of the, 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 the system. And it's, it's one further method to, to dr drive down the, the risk. But of course, it, it's not going to be a panacea by itself. It needs to be used in combination with uh, 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 all of the, the other non pharmacological methods. Thank you, Ivan. Um, Tomas Ryan, you wanted to come in. So I think that um, we get a lot of questions as, as scientists about safety for children and safety in schools. And some people are asking, what is the difference between now and say September of last year? Uh, and I think what's missing from the conversation, apart from the schools are safe mantra, is known to be wrong internationally and has been for some time, and that schools don't contribute to transmission in the community, that that assumption has also been proven wrong, as Jerry Killeen outlined, um, is that aside from those two facts, we have found ourselves now in a completely new situation. Uh, the situation that we're in now is different for a number of reasons. Uh, the most, I think, significant of which is that we have high case numbers, but relaxing restrictions. So never before in the pandemic, and it's really not an exaggeration to say this, although it sounds a little bit sensationalist, never before in the pandemic have children been more exposed mm -hmm. to the virus. And the reason for that is that regardless of whether schools are open or closed, before now in the pandemic, we have been protecting children by protecting everyone. In the first wave, we all stayed at home. In the second wave, when we opened schools in September 2021, 
excuse me, September 2020, we had about 60 cases a day at the beginning of that week of the original Wuhan variant. In the, se- in the third wave in January 2021, we decided not to open schools because we had thousands of cases a day of the British B117 alpha variant. Um, and then we had a very long period of restrictions. Those restrictions were not just protecting children, they were protecting everyone. Now we have his case numbers to Christmas, to the point where the Tonish de Leo Varadkar has admitted that we could be facing 4,000 cases a day or more in September and October, which are benefit scenarios, of the Delta variant, which is highly transmissible, and we haven't yet observed how it moves really in the Irish school environment. Uh, But crucially, that society as a whole is opening up, that we are moving towards relaxed restrictions, that people are socializing more, and that there's far more opportunity for the Delta variant to get into our schools at these very high levels and to spread within them. If we were to open schools tomorrow at the current case numbers, then simplistic calculations would suggest that about one in 10 groups of 30 students would have an active COVID-19 case in their environment, uh, assuming that person was not staying at home and isolating. And of course, people who are pre-symptomatic don't have symptoms and so don't know if they need to isolate. So you can imagine a situation where somewhere between one in 10 and one in 20 classrooms in the entire country has an active COVID-19 spreader on their first day. And then we can consider what's happening in Australia and modeling that has been done in the USA which show that the attack rate in a classroom environment where transmission is unmitigated, where there is no face masks or other measures in place, that in a single day you could infect up to 70% of the other people in the classroom. Uh, Under this scenario, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how most students can be infected with this virus in a couple of months uh, before we have the opportunity to vaccinate all teenagers and before it becomes possible to vaccinate under 12s. And this will cause a lot of hospitalization. If it happens, it will cause a lot of long COVID. And that's why we think that the current situation with schools is particularly alarming. Now, if we employ face masks, if we properly regulate ventilation, um, if we strongly encourage proper contact tracing within schools, which has not really been done in the past, and most crucially, if everybody keeps their children at home when they have any symptoms, which is the single most crucial thing we can all be doing, then we can substantially reduce this risk and we can prevent the possibilities of a large number of children being infected or of having to close schools entirely, which we don't really want to do. Uh, And of course, the contributing factors to the wider epidemiological situation, which could result in a fourth lockdown in the coming Uh, autumn and winter, which we also want to avoid. What we're saying about the mitigation measures, about masks, about testing, about ventilation, these are things that we've known for over a year now that people have been saying for over a year. What's different about this current situation is how exposed the under 18 population is to this latest variant at extremely high case numbers, uh, while the rest of the community is protected by vaccination. Uh, children are not protected by vaccination. We have to find other ways of protecting them. Thank you, Tomas. And you mentioned their contact tracing. And of course, we've seen in recent weeks that the, the rules have changed regarding contact tracing. And now if a contact is um, a vaccinated individual, they no longer have to go for testing and uh, take the other steps. And this raises all kinds of uh, potential Uh, difficult scenarios in a classroom where you might have a child who has not yet received their vaccine either because um, maybe medically they they are not uh, recommended for vaccination or because they themselves are still awaiting their appointment and they might be sitting beside somebody vaccinated who is a contact and how are they ever going to know that and what should you do if you even learnt that you take your child out preemptively it becomes very very difficult and I don't believe there's any evidence based to this change in the contact tracing because, um, in fact, the evidence is that vaccinated people can carry the virus and transmit it. So 
it is important information to factor in and we shouldn't be discarding that. Um, Orla, there's some questions that have come in for you. You won't be surprised. People are very interested in your um, practical knowledge. Um, there's one question from somebody who says, as a secondary teacher, that they would like to personally buy a portable CO2 monitor because they know there won't be one per classroom. So they, they and they have colleagues who feel similarly. And they're asking if, do you, if you have recommendations for buying these and would any basic one be sufficient? Yeah, firstly, what's recommended is that it's NDIR. That's the mechanism that's used. They're more accurate. So if somebody is looking to look for one online, NDIR is recommended. Um, there are a number of uh, suppliers in Ireland who are uh, importing them. Um, I would I would somewhat reassure people about not having one for every classroom. Like these are very small, very light and very portable. Um, so it's not like having a smoke detector where it suddenly goes off and everybody has to respond. It's more a learning tools where you can watch the level rising um, so so if classrooms are sharing um, they might find that one classroom needs very little windows open that it's very exposed and it has good cross ventilation the classroom next door might be in a different part of the building um, or maybe the class is more crowded I think people you know there may be a supply issue uh, just with deliveries and they're managing the numbers that they can get as best they can so I wouldn't be overly critical of starting without having one in every classroom um, and I think there will be a learning curve over September where people start moving them around the building and I think there will be a lot of reassurance actually for some people in doing that um, and we'll get the added benefit that children will take this knowledge home and and they'll start telling their parents and grandparents about opening the window and why it's important so so you know we can we can educate the whole community through the schools as well um so i, I can understand that people are personally anxious but i but i think it is a major achievement to have what we will have and and that it will presumably roll out and we we will have more and it'll be adopted more widely um so uh, yeah, I, I understand the, the kind of concern. Um, also in terms of filtration, I think uh, it is something that people might start to think about, you know, from a small room for about 100, 150 euro, um, you can have, you can get filtration and maybe two or three in a classroom or, or, or in a special needs classroom or in a preschool, uh, you know, or a creche kind of type setting um, in smaller rooms. Um, with a lot of close proximity might be a very good protection as well. And I think it's something that parents who maybe have one vulnerable child might think about at home, that they, if at all possible, they don't have children sharing bedrooms and, and that the vulnerable child might be in a room where they put in some filtration and they run that, uh, you know, in and they move it around the house to meal times or to the bedroom or the bathroom or wherever the child is. Um, so there are things I think we could we could give people much much better information mm -hmm. about protecting children in small ways rather than thinking globally about schools only. Thanks, Orla. Um, Claire Kelly, I think I'll just come to you quickly because there is a question about masks we've had talked about masks quite a bit but in terms of the messaging around masks and there have been some stories that have been put out about them perhaps even um harming children and um, mm. these stories of course have not um uh, held up against the evidence but could you perhaps just um summarize that for us please Sure. Thanks, Aoife. Um, yeah, I think there's been, you know, this group has been calling for masks in primary schools from early in the year before the reopening of schools that happened in um, March of this year um, after the surge at Christmas. Um, and, you know, it, there, there seems to be quite a, a very a vocal minority who um, are uh, objecting to um, the requirement for for young children to wear masks in schools, and it, it seems you know completely um, unfounded on evidence. Now, like you say, there there have been um, some uh, myths circulating, um, not helped by um, in this uh, in the summer of this year. There was a study that was actually published in in a major journal. Um, that suggested that masks um, increased um, CO2 levels, um, uh, you know, uh, that were breathed in by children to unhealthy levels. That um, study was subsequently retracted. That means it was completely um, removed and um, the, you know, the authors could not stand over 
um, and the journal could not stand over that evidence. And it was uh, very, com uh, very comprehensive. <laughs> There's an echo. Sorry. Um, so it was, it was, there, yeah. Go on, Claire. This, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry. So it was very comp comprehensively dismissed. Um, so there is the, the idea that there is any harm to children posed by the wearing of masks is completely unsupported by any evidence. Some people are concerned about things like communication. Emotion recognition, which will be affected to some extent by the wearing of masks, but we have to remember that this is only for a small part of a child's day, and ultimately the idea is that we are protecting children. Um, and these are, you know, these this kind of limitation, perhaps in emotion recognition due to the hiding of the face. It's going to be, um, you know, emotion recognition, for example, might be. Um, impaired slightly. Um, children still have um, the eyes and other um, bodily expressions to, on which to base reading of emotion. Um, so it's impaired slightly and only for part of the day and very unlikely to have long-term effects. What's much more likely to have long-term effect is, is infection with COVID. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to, to say is this, you know, there's a, a, I think a kind of very troubling narrative that has emerged around the children who do become sick or the children who do become hospitalized, that they are um, uh, children who have, you know, underlying conditions. You know, some of those underlying conditions are incredibly common. Asthma, one in 10 children is affected by overweight. One in five uh, uh, Irish children are currently considered overweight. Um, and besides the fact that these are very common conditions, you know, are people with underlying conditions somehow worth less? Um, should we, you know, uh, should we not um, offer them the same level of protection as everyone else? And I think that's a, a really troubling, problematic um, uh, uh, narrative that has emerged around the children who are um, quite clearly harmed by, by COVID infection. Thank you, Claire. So we have some, um, some questions and some comments. I think I'm just going to to use to 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 wrap up for the day because they've got some very um very insightful comments from different attendees so um, one of our attendees has says that this schools are safe mantra has has done a lot of damage because because people believe it um too much and it's it's not automatically true that schools are safe and um they have to be made safe of course but also that's schools don't have within them the expertise or the staff to carry out the proper risk assessment for COVID, and um, the boards of managers or volunteers, and um, you know they've been they've been thrown into this. Um, and somebody else is making the comment that I think it is very worth remembering that principals and teachers are in the dark, um, like anybody else, and they are somewhat obliged to follow guidelines. So, if anybody does want to talk to their their school teachers and principals just remember that and if you are feeling personally frustrated remember it's not the fault of the teachers or the principals and um, if you're having a conversation with them and um, you know it, it could be a conversation that could be useful and fruitful but um you know those people can be quite worn down by what's been happening over the last year and a bit as well and you know a lot of this has been uh, maybe falling at, at their door and um, you know this combined with the presumption that schools are safe is giving this kind of magical property to the schools and the teachers which is maybe a, a burden um perhaps on them as well so um we have just to, to summarize and to to wrap up for the day then we see ourselves in a context where the case numbers are rising in ireland in nearly every part of ireland 21 out of 26 counties the case numbers are going up they're as high as they were at the end of January this year. And we know that January, in January, Ireland had some of the highest case rates in the world. So this might um, numb us somewhat um, to you know, what is going on now. We shouldn't be comparing against January. January was awful. And it's not the high bar, which uh, you know we should be thinking against. If it doesn't get that bad, it's still not bad. That was awful and we shouldn't get even close. Um, we also see that um, regrettably this does transmit in children and it does cause illness in a in a certain number of children as well we are about to return to schools there are things we can do to make schools safer and um, we can reduce the risk we can um, 
we can ask the government and uh, to require high quality, well-fitting face masks for all children uh, five plus. We can ask them to give proper guidelines and support to schools for monitoring the ventilation. CO2 monitors are going to be a very useful tool for that and for then mitigating the ventilation where they discover that it isn't adequate. And Orla has mentioned opening windows and how that is going to be sufficient in many cases, sometimes even just a crack. But where opening the windows is not enough, it is possible to get HEPA filtration technology, which is not an expensive technology. It's not a very new technology either. It is physical removal of particles from the air. It's not it's not any kind of magic, um, anything strange, and it's well, well known, well recognized, well-established technology. And then with also the possibility of um, antigen testing or something along those lines, we can change the risk profile of the schools. We can make them a lot safer. And we owe it to our children to protect them from infection and to uh, protect their education because they have now had two years of disrupted education and it would be so unjust if they had another disrupted year. Time passes very fast when you're that age and uh, two or three years in the life of somebody that age is a huge amount of time. And um, we have to be really aware of that. And there's nobody except us, the adults, to protect the children. It is our responsibility and we must take that seriously. So there are things that can be done and they must be done. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attention today. Thank you, Orla Hegarty, uh, for your contribution. Very, very welcome. It's always great to have you here. And um, thank you, Anthony, Gabriel, Tomas, Jerry, Ivan, Claire, everybody. It's been a really great discussion and we've seen there's been huge interest um, from our attendees and uh, lots of questions coming in. It's a very, very important topic. Um, and so thank you very much, everybody, for giving their time today to discuss this. See you next time.